The UK motor industry has been one lined with hundreds of companies that have ranged from small enterprises based in garden sheds to gigantic corporations that employed hundreds of engineers, designers and craftsmen, with the many projects reaping varied success throughout the decades. Among these many motoring tales, one example appeared in the unlikely location of South Wales, where a local butcher took it upon himself to form his own car company, and while this venture was short-lived, the resulting models have found a niche in the annals of Britain's automotive heritage as among the most stylistic, this fondly remembered machine being the mighty Gilburn. The story of the Gilburn begins with Giles Smith, a local butcher living in Church Village near Pontypridd, South Wales, during the late 1950s, who decided that, in the face of rising trends for glass fibre based specials such as the Elva Mark IV, he would invest in the creation of a one-off car of his own after a chance encounter with German glass fibre engineer Bernard Fries, a former prisoner of war who had decided to stay and raise a family in Kent. Fries, who had been working for a glass fibre special producer building a model called the Martin, initially was hesitant to help Giles create his own car based on any of the specials currently on the market, and after some discussion, the pair chose to design their own model from scratch with local amateur racing driver, Peter Cottrell, being asked to inspect the machine once it neared completion. The car, christened the Gilburn, as a portmanteau of the names Giles and Bernard, was fitted with a 948cc BMC A-series engine from an Austin A35, producing 36 horsepower, as well as incorporating the A35's front suspension unit, while the chassis was fabricated from square steel tubing, and the fiberglass body was a one-piece moulding, with Cottrell, enthused by the car's style and profile, feeling that simply making it a one-off would have been a waste of potential, speculating that the car could carve out its own niche in the market for glass fibre specials. Production of the first unit was undertaken behind Giles's butcher shop in Church Village, and first test runs were undertaken by Cottrell in May 1960 at Landau Airfield, with Autosport magazine giving the car a favourable review, while construction of the initial models, now known as the Gilburn GT, would be done through the sale of a basic kit, including the body and chassis, while the owner would source the necessary mechanical parts, but this idea fared poorly, and thus later Gilburns would be sold with all new parts, meaning that the company had to purchase engines and gearboxes from local dealers and garages due to the quantities being so small that they couldn't obtain trade discounts. Essentially, the customer was purchasing an almost finished car, including a painted, moulded body which was wired and trimmed, and all the components necessary to get the car running, the engine, gearbox, back axle, wheels and exhaust system with assembly of the car, for seasoned mechanics, being accomplished over a weekend, while the components themselves were new and under warranty from whichever manufacturer built them originally, and customers buying the Gilburn as components rather than a completed machine were able to avoid purchase taxes, which varied between 19 and 45%. In 1961, as popularity for the Gilburn GT increased, Giles used a £700 loan from his father to buy a larger site at the former Red Ash Colliery just outside Church Village which had closed in 1921, with car production only occupying a small part of the site, while the rest of the space was rented out to other users. The construction rate for Gilburn cars proceeded at one unit per month, each machine manufactured by a workforce of five people, including Giles and Bernard, while modifications to the GT design were implemented over time, starting with the fitting of wire wheels and a trailing arm suspension unit at the rear, before introducing a 1.6 litre power unit from the MGA which gave the car a 0-60 time of 13.8 seconds, a top speed of 94 miles an hour, and a fuel consumption of 35 miles per gallon, this new model, the Gilburn GT1800, costing £978 with taxes, or £22,200 in 2021. As Gilburn's reputation continued to grow, by 1965 the company employed 20 staff with a production rate of one car per week, and during that year, three left-hand drive cars were exported to the United States, followed in 1966 by the company's second model to replace the original GT, the Gilburn Genie, a much larger 2x2 Grand Tourer, fitted with either a 2.5 or 3.0-litre Ford Essex V6 from the Ford Zephyr, while early models used mechanics based on the MGB with Austin Healey 3000 rear axles. Although Ford had offered to provide Gilburn with early versions of their new Essex Ford V4 and V6 engines, the V4 units, fitted to the last of the original GTs, were severely underpowered and of poor design when compared to the larger V6, and thus the final GT800 models, which continued in production alongside the Genie until 1967, were fitted with earlier MGB power plants, much of the reason behind Gilburn not wanting to provide two models simultaneously being due to the company only making a marginal profit, dissuading any attempts to expand production. In a bid to secure its future financially, the Gilburn company was acquired by Ace Capital Holdings, a manufacturer of slot machines, which held a number of going concerns, 
with Giles and Bernard remaining at the helm of the firm for one more year, after which their partnership ended when Giles left the company, followed shortly thereafter by Bernard, leaving the management of the company in the hands of Michael Leather. With Ace Capital providing financial backing, many of the former rented units at the Red Ash Colliery site were purchased by Gilbin in order to increase production, and the workforce expanded from 20 to 60 workers, with four cars a week now being output by the company when their next model, the Gilbin Invader, was launched in July 1969 as a replacement for the Genie. The Invader, while sharing nearly all of the mechanics of the Genie, differing through the use of a redesigned chassis and detailed changes to the bodywork and interior, but the chassis alterations caused problems due to handling and the rapid appearance of stress cracks. This was resolved, though, on the Invader Mark II, which was introduced in 1970, and also included an Invader Estate, which was released in March 1971, while plans were also in the works for an entirely new model called the Gilbin T11, which would have utilised the transverse engine and gearbox from an Austin Maxi, but the T11 met delays due to a market downturn in glass fibre special cars, especially in the United States, where more stringent safety legislation meant the Gilbin models were severely out of step. Eventually, the low-slung sports car would be unveiled in June 1972, making its debut in September of the same year after several technical problems had to be rectified, with the majority of components for the car, including the suspension, coming from the Mark III Ford Cortina, while still retaining the 1.4-litre E-Series inline-four engine from the Austin Maxi as per the original proposal. In a drastic change from the original design ethos of Gilburn, the T11 would be sold as a complete car, as the advent of value-added tax, or VAT, in the UK from 1973 meant that purchase taxes no longer applied, and thus the savings made by selling cars as components rather than fully assembled machines became invalid, with Gilbin planning to market the T11 at a price similar to the Jaguar XJ6 or BMW 2002, while also making a serious effort to produce export models in left-hand drive, employing a dealer based in the Netherlands as sales agent for the car's European output. Sadly, Gilburn's promising future was cut short when the firm entered into sustained losses, supported solely by the financial aid from Ace Capital, and eventually, after accruing debts of £90,000, Ace sold the firm to manager Michael Leather for a derisory sum of £1 in July 1972, who promptly hired external consultants to help improve quality control, work practices and productivity. To break even, though, meant the firm had to build at least four cars per week, a demanding workload that often saw employees coming in on weekends or running overtime, and while the previous £90,000 debt of the Gilburn Company had been paid off upon Ace Capital's withdrawal the previous year, by July 1973 the firm had amassed another debt of £90,000, and thus the company was put into receivership. In September 1973, Anthony M. Peters joined the company as a potential investor, proposing cash injections of £750,000 over the next five-year period to keep production going, but in the wake of the oil crisis, which struck just over a month later, together with problems finding investors, a somewhat lax three-day working week, and the overall expansion of the firm under Ace Capital's tenure having outstripped the limited profit margins of the small company, Gilburn spiralled into financial ruin, and in March 1974, the last cars rolled off the production line. Following the end of Gilburn, many incomplete body shells remained and were sold off at bankruptcy auction to various customers, and while talk circulated of reviving the company as late as 1979, the most that was achieved in bringing back the firm was the completion of the final cars over the following decades by private individuals, including the restoration of the unique T11 prototype and the completion of the sole Gilburn Invader long wheelbase saloon in 2012. For Gilburn, the firm, as arguably the only mass production car builder to come out of Wales, was similar to the likes of Reliant in Tamworth, wherein a small company created by one or two individuals provided machines that answered the call for an unexpected market and thus saw major success for a brief few years. Sadly, despite the promise of the company during the mid-1960s, the era for glass fibre specials was a fleeting one, and with the move away from such cars by the turn of the new decade, Gilburn's death was hanging in the air, but during its short tenure, the Welsh builder was able to make a name for itself among a sea of other British car firms, one that still strikes a chord with enthusiasts to this day.